Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Video Penguin and welcome back to Beyond Kerbal. It has been a little while because uh, the floating colony took so unbelievably long to pull off that uh, I burnt out on KSP a little bit, but I've got my Kerbal mojo back. And now you can see here the Campbell arriving back after its 10th descent down to the Heinlein. And now we are completely out of CO2. So we need to head back to first with our bounty of fusion pellets. Had a few suggestions uh, in the comments of the previous video that I could bring up more fuel from the Heinlein. Uh, people not realizing that it requires a few hundred tons of carbon dioxide to deorbit this thing to stop us burning up uh, and the Campbell can only carry two tons of cargo up into orbit so I mean you do the maths there. Speaking of Heinlein though uh, my very brief comments about Starship Troopers seem to step on a few nerves. Uh, I had <laughs> well to be fair I wasn't I wasn't very clear um, I probably shouldn't have used the word fascist I guess it's it's um more a form of benevolent authoritarianism, I think, is the technical term for the society depicted, you know, as if such a thing could actually exist. But I had a lot of people telling me that I didn't understand the book properly, and I think that's mainly people who just watched the movie and assumed the book is the same. I mean, the movie, Starship Troopers, I don't know why Starship Troopers has surged in relevance again recently. Um, but the movie is a masterpiece of satire, right? It, it is just absolutely tongue-in-cheek taking the complete piss which <laughs> is great um the book is it the book is not satirical and everyone says it, it you're wrong it's it, sorry it isn't satirical it's ironic um in a lot of the military like boot camp scenes uh, it's clearly drawing on highline's own experiences in the military and a lot of it's pretty funny um but the actual political message of the book it's actually Heinlein's own philosophy. He wrote the book because he thought the youth of the 1950s were becoming lazy and spoiled. He believed in military service. He believed in capital punishment. Um, the actual political message of the book is his own philosophy. Now, of course, you don't have to agree with the political message of a book to enjoy it. And I did enjoy the book. I just prefer some of his other novels because you can get across a political message a lot more subtly than literally sitting down the main character in a classroom and having them be taught about the failures of modern society, right? It's, <laughs> it's just a little bit too blatant uh, for my liking. As I said, I do still enjoy it. Um, but yeah, when when you just like a whole chapter is dedicated to being taught about why modern society is bad and it would be improved by forcing everyone to join the military. Um, <laughs> I don't find that particularly enthralling. Anyway, moving on to the mission. You see there we've got our encounter now with Fuss. It didn't take anywhere near as many passes to actually escape from Heber as it did when we were arriving because we're no longer carrying 8,000 tons of assorted cargo. The amount of fuel that we carried allows us to do 10 trips. I mean, I didn't actually do the following nine trips. I just used USI's uh, logistics system because that Floating colony landing was probably the hardest thing I've ever pulled off in Google <laughs> Space Program. Uh, but in future, since we don't have to carry all the other cargo, you know, the building materials, all the fuel for the platform and everything, we could probably carry uh, much more fuel, probably allowing us to do about 50 trips down to the surface. And I think 100 trips in total would be able to refuel the clock entirely. But we're not going to be doing that because this whole trip took about a year. It's about a year round trip to go to Heber and back and fuel up the clock and the clock doesn't really need to be fully refueled right unless it's going to go into stellar again it still has more than enough delta v to just potter about in the valentine system and that's what we're going to be doing uh, for the next few episodes because we've got a bunch of new planets that i want to visit that i want to explore the main reason i built the floating colony uh, well when i did was because i wanted an excuse to visit <laughs> heber because otherwise it's not really much to see i mean there is the moon serex i guess um but andrew draws pretty pictures the developer of extra solar told me not to visit it yet because he wants to update the textures so we're not visiting serex yet we're going to go visit the rest of the solar system we're going to go on a grand tour so we're going to try and uh, lighten up the clock a little bit we're going to remove these massive co2 storage tanks we will have to build uh, a couple of much smaller ones uh but yeah we're going to go on a grand tour of the valentine system plant a flag on each of the planets and claim it for kerbal kind but uh, before we do that, we need to actually get some fuel for the colony on Fust's main reactors. Because if you remember, we ran out of helium-3 and deuterium, which was the reason why, well, we went on this mission in the first place. I mean, we had enough fuel doing a lithium cycle, but we use lithium to power our condors, so I'd rather not use it up if we can help it. 
So we've refitted the IEV Wells, one of our cargo condors, to carry fusion pellets instead of liquid fuel and oxidizer. And Lemor Kerman, our rather reliable <laughs> condor pilot at this point, is going to head up to the clock and grab a whole tank load of fusion pellets to power the Weir colony while we're gallivanting off around the star system. I, I keep saying solar system and I know it's not technically correct. It's, it's, it's a star system, and as I say, extra solar system. Solar system refers to our solar system. Technically, you can't even use it for the Archangel slash Kerbal system, because it should be Kerbola system, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, as you see, we're powering ourselves into orbit. This is a pretty, yeah, pretty standard flight profile now, docking with the clock. We have to do a small inclination change as well, but it's all pretty standard stuff. Now, of course, we're going to have to design a new spacecraft. And in fact, uh, I actually got designing a brand new type of spacecraft to be able to land on every single planet and moon in the Valentine system, powered by fusion, uh, because I'm tired of using antimatter. Antimatter is very dangerous <laughs> and uh, very explosive. And also a lot of the antimatter containers actually have G tolerances. Uh, which we got very, very close to with the floating colony mission. I mean, we pulled some serious <laughs> acceleration and deceleration Gs during that mission. And uh, in a few of the failed attempts, which you didn't see, uh, we actually exceeded the safety tolerances on the antimatter storage tanks and blew up the Campbell in a rather spectacular fashion. Because, of course, we're magnetically confining the antimatter. If it touches the walls of the container, it annihilates with the matter and... Yeah, goodbye <laughs> to your spacecraft. So yeah, if you have too many Gs actually accelerating said antimatter into the walls of the container, then the whole spacecraft is going to explode. You can actually reduce the mass of the antimatter tanks by um, reducing their G tolerances. Um, but I actually had them at, at the maximum for the Campbell because yeah, we threw that thing around the skies of Heba without much regard uh, for its poor pilot Katrina Kerman. Although she seems pretty keen to be uh, to test flying our brand new spacecraft, which will be revealed very shortly. We actually ended up um, taking all of the fusion pellets that we got from our trip because it required some fusion pellets to fly all the way out to Heba and fly back. So we netted about 70,000 units of fusion pellets and then we've just filled up this condor with 70,000 units. But the, the Ivy Clark, it has so much Delta V. I mean, it looks like it doesn't have much fuel, but you've got to keep in mind, we were firing that engine for weeks at a time to get out to this star system. So flying around the Valentine system really doesn't use all that much Delta V, especially considering a lot of the planets don't have particularly strong gravity and the entire star system fits within the orbit of Eve. So well, I guess Demise now, it got renamed, didn't it? So yeah, it does not require much Delta V or even much time to just do standard home and transfers out to all the various different planets. So, I was actually pretty proud of this descent here. I think this is the, the most spot on we got it. We, we decelerated right over the colony, and I thought that was that was rather impressive. I was quite proud of myself, <laughs> especially because uh, the world is a little bit more difficult to control, what with about having, having 10 tons or so of fusion pellets stocked up inside. Uh, it turns out, though, it's, uh, it's about enough fusion pellets to keep the colony powered for 90,000 years. So, yeah, if you needed an idea of just how dense a... <laughs> power source fusion pellets are oh, yeah this is why they're so difficult to get a hold of remember it took what about 10 years or so to fuel up the clark by so sifting helium 3 out of the regolith um on nemesis whereas we've we could fuel up the clark within you know a few days with just trips down to uh, or down. I always see. I always keep saying surface, but of course Heba doesn't have a surface down into the atmosphere of Heba because, well, you know, most of the atmosphere is actually made up of helium three and deuterium, so it's very, very easy to harvest. You can see here we're swapping the main reactor back over to spin polarized helium three deuterium fusion, and that will last us, as I said, about ninety thousand years. So. We also brought Katrina Kerman back down so that she could be the first to pilot our brand new spacecraft. This is an Excalibur because Arthur 
although it's Arthur C. Clarke, but Arthur is going to wield it across the star system, and this is named the IEV Pullman, named after Philip Pullman, author of the His Dark Materials trilogy, a trilogy I was a very big fan of when I was younger. I'm actually reading the Book of Dust trilogy at the moment that he's releasing at the moment. Not as much of a fan of it, to be honest, um, but I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, because every time I discuss whether I like books or not, for some reason it annoys people, so <laughs> let's just stay clear of it. You can see there, we actually had to use some of our standard liquid fuel and oxidizer engines just to take off from the colony, and that's because we're using another one of those Z-Pinch fusion aerospikes to power this spacecraft. Slight problem with those engines being that they spew out a deadly amount of neutron radiation. So we have to get to a minimum safe distance from the colony before we can safely fire it. But once we're away from the colony, this thing has a lot of Delta V. I was actually originally planning to dock with the Clark and then fuel it up. Um, then I got into orbit and realized, yeah, we barely used any of our onboard CO2. So, uh, yeah, we can fly straight out to our target for the rest of this episode uh, without having to get anywhere near the clock. Because, of course, we haven't actually visited Fust's moon Cuprus yet. So we're going to go give it a little visit. It's actually sort of reminds all our Kerbals of home a little bit because it has a mint frosted ice cream sort of coloring very similar to Minmus. I say reminds them of home. They're from Solitude, so they, they're not used to seeing Minmus in the sky. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what I'm really on about, <laughs> to be honest. It reminds them of their, their much more ancient home of Kerbin, and it's, uh, its ancient fabled moon of Minmus, which, of course, later crashed into the moon and created the moon Malice, which we visited earlier on in the series. But the cool thing about Cuprus is it actually has a very, very thin atmosphere, coloured um, kind of... And then it's sort of opposite to solitude, you know, being coloured by iron oxide, coloured by copper oxide, which of course is what gives it its very distinctive lime green, well, I guess it's mint green sort of colouring, which is rather beautiful. But the atmosphere, despite the fact it's only about 10 kilometres high and about 0 0.02 atmospheres thick, it does refract light from Valentine in a really rather beautiful fashion. I mean, look at that. Oh. Gorgeous. Create some really, really beautiful views this episode. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the atmosphere consists of. I mean, there must obviously be some airborne copper oxide, but um, it has a very, very thin atmosphere. I'm not sure what it consists of. Maybe we should have brought some scientific instruments. I've stopped putting scientific instruments on all of our craft because we finished the tech tree ages ago. Um, so, you know, it's just another thing to have to worry about, you know, keeping an eye on the science alerts and activating all of the experiments when we enter a new biome and I just can't really be bothered with it anymore because we don't have a use for science so just pretend that there are scientific instruments on board but we're not actually visiting the North Pole of Cuprus for scientific reasons we're mainly visiting not just to sample the atmosphere but because we've been receiving a strange signal from its North Pole, a very similar signal to the one that we found from the North Pole of Guardian, the moon of solitude back home. And if you remember, or maybe you don't remember because it's highly classified and you know, the Kerbals in black might have wiped your mind, but uh, we actually found some ancient alien ruins at the North Pole of Guardian that definitely weren't just a terrain glitch. It seemed like some kind of map which actually led us out here to fust. Now, of course, we all naturally assumed that we were being led out to a habitable world, but perhaps fust itself is actually just a complete sideshow, a complete distraction. We actually misinterpreted the message. Perhaps the whole purpose of those ruins was to lead us to this next set of ruins. This giant crater we found at the exact North Pole, surrounded by what appears to be some kind of towers, some kind of pyramids, a henge, if you will. Now, of course, it's going to take some time for our scientists to decode the meaning of these strange ancient structures, but they appear to be, once again, some kind of map pointing deep out into the cosmos with a far more sinister message. Who left them here? And why? That is a question which we will be, we will be answering in future episodes. Of course, an interesting thing about these structures is after doing some uh, some basic X-ray spectrometry, we can deduce that the structures aren't made of materials from this world. And they actually appear to be older than the moon itself, which is rather interesting. But we'll uh, 
let the eggheads back on fast, sort of uh, pour over the data we've got there, and we're just going to admire this beautiful view of Valentine as we ascend back up. Yeah, I guess back up into the atmosphere. <laughs> it's not a very thick atmosphere. It only goes up to 10 kilometers. Uh, but we're going to get ourselves back out into orbit and head back to the Clark. Because this was sort of like a shakedown cruise for the IEV Pullman. And yeah, it has performed absolutely flawlessly. So now we're going to go back to the Clark. We're going to dock with it. Then we'll fuel up the Clark. We'll add a few much smaller <laughs> carbon dioxide storage tanks so we can refuel this craft. And then, as I said, we're going to be heading out to Solith and then Mir and then Lomina, which is a massive ice giant with some rather beautiful rings on the edge of the Valentine system. We're going to have some pretty view beautiful views in the next few episodes. And I'm really rather looking forward to it. Katrina of course having to be the one to plant a flag on every single one of them anyway you see there we've got ourselves out into orbit and we're going to blast ourselves back we made sure to save uh, a bit of our liquid fuel and oxidize it because of course we need to actually decelerate once we get to the clock we you know similar to <laughs> blasting off from weir we do not want to murder everybody on board the clock with a rather unhealthy dose of neutron radiation one thing that I did actually have to keep doing is I have to keep telling our solar panels to track the correct star because every time I loaded a quick save or went to the tracking station and came back, they kept trying to track Archangel, which of course is about 1% of a light year away. So you're not going to get a great deal of energy from that. So I had to keep selecting their tracking body and telling them, no, point at, point at the star that we're next to. You'd think that it would do it automatically and you know, point at the nearest star. Maybe it's every time we go into shadow, if it can't actually directly see Valentine, they point at Archangel and then once they're pointing at Archangel, they just, they're just they just pointing at that by default. I don't know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> have to keep commanding these solar panels to actually point at the star that we are right next to. And there she is, the Clark in all of her glory. Yeah, I didn't really put that much thought into uh into where i put the docking port on the pullman uh, and as you can see i wasn't entirely sure if we we're gonna have enough room the engine nacelle is uh <laughs> is on the same side as the docking port so i don't think we're going to be able to line this up as uh, precisely as i would like we've got some pretty powerful um erection control systems on the clock though and it's already a pretty humongous spacecraft so docking it near the center of mass um, we shouldn't offset it much um, ideally we would have a second equally sized spacecraft or something on the opposite side perhaps actually we'll put the co2 storage tanks on the other side and try and balance it out but really it doesn't matter too much we can have a very slightly offset center of mass and it shouldn't actually affect us too badly with the ship on this scale you don't tend to have to worry but yeah as you can see yep uh, the engine nacelle did get in the way so we have to rotate this uh it's really rather sort of stubby stumpy sort of spacecraft isn't it i don't know whether i like the way that the escalable looks and we'll be building more of them in future which why they gave them a, a an actual craft name as well as an individual name for this specific spacecraft but yeah i don't know whether i like the look of it or not i don't know you guys can tell me whether or not you like it in the comments below. Something I do definitely like the look of, though, is our latest batch of fan art on the screen now. You guys seem to really uh, appreciate the, you know, how much, <laughs> how much I appreciated all the fan art that you sent me. And now I've been receiving quite a bit of it. So, and now I'm just going to showcase fan art at the end of every episode because I really do love it. Keep it coming. Send it to me on my Discord. I absolutely love it. But that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I've been the Beardy Penguin, and I will see you next time.